Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Let me regain my composure. First Corinthians fifteen, verse nineteen through twenty three, the resurrection. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ, the firstfruits, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that during this time, you would give the stillness and the attentiveness of every heart. You could open up our minds, soften our hearts, give us understanding of your word, and help us to live to the glory of Christ. It's in Christ's name we do humbly pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. When Jesus was crucified, buried, laid in that tomb, he rose three days later. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 tells us that he spent 40 days with the apostles, being seen of them by many infallible proofs. He taught them the things that they needed to know that they had yet to understand about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Many infallible proofs. When you think about infallible proofs, that's one of the things that helps us to understand how these apostles were transformed. They were transformed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prior to his resurrection, when he was arrested, they forsook him. They fled. They went into hiding. They were afraid that what happened to Christ may happen to them. And then the resurrection happened. And that changed everything. These men who were in hiding became fearless leaders of the church. These men who were in hiding became fearless preachers of the gospel. And by the time we get to the book of 1 Corinthians, I want everybody to know and to understand that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a known doctrine It had been taught and preached by this time of the book of 1 Corinthians. It had been taught and preached for 25 years. And in the early parts of the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, particularly verse 3, Paul says, That which I have received declare I unto you. That means that the gospel had been presented to Paul. The doctrine of the resurrection had been presented to Paul. How Jesus would be crucified. How he would be buried. How he would rise from the dead. And Paul declares unto us that which he has already received. The first message of the resurrection 
is found in Acts chapter 2, verse 24, given by the Apostle Peter. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. These people had seen the works of Christ. They had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. They were very well aware of his power. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up. Praise the Lord. Amen. Having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Praise the Lord. You know, the very next chapter, right after that, in Acts chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, Peter preached... But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead. The resurrection was preached early. Christ was raised from the dead. For 40 days he spent time with the apostles through many infallible proofs, presenting himself alive, teaching them about the kingdom of God. After 40 days, he ascended to heaven, and 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was given. And Jesus preached this first sermon on the resurrection of Christ. Throughout the book of Acts, the apostles preached the resurrection of Christ to both Jew and Gentile. In reading the Bible, we find out that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is fundamental in apostolic preaching. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of Christianity. And again... 1 Corinthians 15, 3, Paul writes that he received and he passed on the teaching of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Not only did he pass on the teaching of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, he also became an eyewitness of the resurrected Christ. In Acts chapter 9, verse 3 through 6, when Paul was on his way to Damascus to put in chains those who believed in Christ and to carry them back to Jerusalem so they could be tried, convicted, and executed. That's what Paul was doing. On that road to Damascus, Christ suddenly appeared to him. He blinded him. With the glory of God, Paul was blinded. Paul was humbled. Paul became a changed man. This one who previously persecuted Christians, this one who had an intense hatred for Christ, became a Christian. The proof of the resurrection. Next, chapter 9, verse 20, immediately following his conversion... Paul preached that Christ is the Son of God. In Acts chapter 13, verse 29, in Pisidian Antioch, Paul preached that Jesus was crucified, taken down from the cross, laid in the tomb, but God raised him from the dead. Paul gave testimony to the resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 through 9, this is what it says. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, 
that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren of wants of whom the greater part remain unto this present time but some are fallen asleep after that he was seen of James then of all the apostles and last of all he was seen of me also as one born out of due time for I am the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God I want to pay attention to these eyewitnesses Cephas refers to the apostle Peter the one who denied him three times when he was being tried prior to the crucifixion. Peter saw the resurrected Christ. Matter of fact, in John 21, verse 15 through 17, Christ restored Peter to his ministry. The resurrected Christ. Peter saw him. James was one of the half-brothers of Christ. You can read in John chapter 7, verse 2 through 5, that James, among the other brothers of Christ, they didn't believe in him. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 7, he appeared, to Jesus, he appeared to James. Would that change your mind? James not only became a believer in Christ, he was the senior pastor of the church of Jerusalem. It ended up in 62 AD that James gave his life for Christ. The Pharisees took James up on the pinnacle of the temple and said, renounce Christ now or die. He refused to renounce Christ. They pushed him off the roof of the temple. James gave his life for Christ. The apostles who had forsaken him, they saw the resurrected Jesus. And Paul, who had despised him, he saw the resurrected Christ. And Paul became a new creation. In Acts chapter 13, verse 32 and 33, again, in Pisidian Antioch, Paul preaches. And we declare unto you glad tidings. That means good news. The gospel. We declare unto you glad tidings. How that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children in that he hath raised up Jesus Romans 1 verse 3 and 4 Paul wrote to the church in Rome that Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead Christ claimed to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of the dead. He's alive. He's Son of God. The resurrection proved that. In Acts 17, 31, in Athens, Paul preached that God hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. Acts chapter 26, verse 23. As Paul is standing before King Herod Agrippa, Paul bore witness that the Christ was to suffer and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and the Gentiles. Paul writes 
in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And I want you to know why he wrote that. Because there were people in the church of Corinth who did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe it. They didn't even believe in the very concept of a bodily resurrection. Look back in verse 12 with me in 1 Corinthians 15. This is what Paul writes. Now if Christ be preached that he rose among, from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And he continues on this theme, showing how important it is that people understand and accept and acknowledge the physical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, you find out that if Christ is not risen, then preaching is in vain. The word vain, kenos, in the Greek means empty. It means preaching has no substance to it whatsoever if Christ is not risen from the dead. There's no point. Anybody that's preaching the word of God, if Christ is not risen from the dead, they're a fool. There's no reason to be preaching. We preach because Christ rose from the dead. If Christ is not risen, you see also in verse 14 that our faith is in vain. Again, the word kenos, vain, empty. Faith has no purpose without the resurrection of Christ. Verse 15. If Christ is not risen, we are found to be false witnesses of God. That means quite simply that if the resurrection is not true, then the apostles were liars. Verse 17, Paul uses another word for vain. If Christ is not risen, it's written again, our faith is in vain. This time, instead of using the word kenos for vain, meaning empty, he uses the word mateos, which means it has no purpose or meaning. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, faith has no purpose. You can just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. Because if death has power over Jesus, he's defeated. If death has power over Jesus, he's not God. If Jesus is not God, he cannot be the sacrifice for our sin. And if Jesus is not the sacrifice for our sin, that means sin is not paid for. And we are all desperately lost and destined for hell. Verse 18 says that if Christ is not risen, then those who have died in Christ have perished in their sin. There's no hope for salvation. Verse 19, if Christ is not risen, then we are of all people most miserable. You may ask, well, why? You may ask, well, so what? Because without the resurrection of Christ, this life is all there is. And you can have your best life now, 
because this life is all there is. And if this is the best that it gets, we are of all people the most pitiable, the most miserable. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we are hopeless. It would make no sense without the resurrection of Jesus Christ to follow Christ. It would make no sense. Why would we bother with the problems that Christians face? Why? Why bother to stand against the world of sin? Why bother to deny self, take up the cross, and follow Christ if there is no resurrection? But because Jesus is risen... He's proven that he has the power to defeat sin, death, hell, and Satan. Jesus has prevailed. And because Christ has prevailed, we overcome. Because Jesus is risen... We serve a living Savior who makes intercession for us this very day. Because he's risen, he's seated on the right hand of God. Because he's risen, he's done as he's promised, and he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within every born-again believer to guide them through this life, to preserve their salvation And because he is risen and he is alive, we can be assured that he's coming again. Given the reality that to be a follower of Jesus means to deny self, take up the cross daily and follow Christ, we have to recognize that followers of Jesus face many challenges in this world but because of the resurrection of Jesus we overcome the world it's true that in Luke 13 verse 24 Jesus teaches we must strive to enter into the narrow gate he teaches in Matthew chapter 10 verse 34 through 37 that because of having relationship with him, because of being saved, because of being a Christian, we may lose fellowship with members of our own family. These things are true. According to 2 Corinthians 6, 14, a Christian cannot have unequal yoking to an unbeliever. According to Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, we must separate ourselves from ungodly counsel. According to Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we must present ourselves before God as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable form of service. We must be transformed By the renewing of our mind, we must not be conformed to the world. And if you want a good picture of what it means to suffer for Christ, study the life of the Apostle Paul. And just if you want a brief synopsis of all of that, look particularly at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through 28 where Paul gives testimony of the hardships he went through because of being a servant of Christ. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, we see that Christ made sure that when he called the Apostle Paul, 
that Christ taught him what he would suffer for the cause of Christ. For unbelievers, this life is the best it's ever going to get. And when this life is over, it's going to be more miserable than this life ever could be. Because those in the state of unbelief will die and spend eternity in hell, separated from God. But how different it is for the Christian. The best it will ever be in this life for the believer will pale in comparison to our inheritance in heaven. Our inheritance in heaven to be in the presence of eternal God, to be in the presence of Jesus Christ forever. The very presence of Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of our own resurrection. And again, I state this because of its importance. The resurrection of Jesus is the essential doctrine of the Christian faith. Here's what Martin Luther had to say about that. Martin Luther writes, Everything depends on our retaining a firm hold on this doctrine in particular. For if this one totters and no longer counts, all the others will lose their value and validity. Very true. Charles Spurgeon. If Jesus rose, then this gospel is what it professes to be. If he rose not from the dead, then it's all deceit and delusion. If Christ had not raised from the dead, his ministry would not have been validated by God. But because Jesus rose from the dead, God validated the teachings, the very ministry, the healings of Christ as being of God being done by God. To more fully understand the importance of the resurrection, from Romans 1-4, Christ's divinity is proven by the resurrection. He is declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Christ's divinity, the fact that he is God, is proven by the resurrection. Romans 14, 9, Christ's sovereignty is proven by the resurrection. Sovereignty comes from, the, from a word that means all reign. It means that Christ reigns over all. And his sovereignty is proved by the resurrection. Romans 14, 9, Christ died and rose and lived again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Lord. Our justification depends upon the resurrection of Christ. Romans 4, 5. For Jesus was delivered for our offenses and was raised for our justification. What does justification mean? Being as though we had never sinned in the first place. We're justified by the resurrection of Christ. That's salvation, folks. Salvation depends upon the resurrection of Christ. Roman, uh, 1 Peter 1, 3, our hope depends upon the resurrection. Because God the Father, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead.
Romans 8, 11. Our resurrection depends upon the resurrection of Jesus. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, that means make alive, will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. The resurrection of Christ. In verse 20, Paul affirms the resurrection. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Paul affirms Jesus is risen. Paul not only received this truth, this doctrine, and then passed it on to others, but Paul saw the resurrected Christ. It's important to notice this mention of first fruits here. That Christ has become the first fruits of them that slept. I have several comments to make here about this word and its importance. The Feast of First Fruits was a celebration where they went out into the field and got a sheaf of grain. They waved that sheaf of grain before the high, before God. And that sheaf of grain anticipated a great harvest to follow. The Feast of First Fruits was going out into the field and get the first, the first of the grain. And waving that grain offering before God anticipated the great harvest to follow. What is important to know about this is one, Christ was crucified at Passover. He became the fulfillment of of Passover. He is the Passover Lamb of God. He was raised on the day of first fruits. The very day the Jewish people were celebrating the feast of first fruits, Christ rose from the dead. From Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, we find that the feast of first fruits is observed the day after the Sabbath, following the Passover. Christ was crucified on Passover. The day after the Sabbath, he was raised from the dead. Christ is the fulfillment of Passover. He is also the fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits. More on that later. So Paul says, now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So keep this in mind. The feast of first fruits was a celebration of the harvest to come. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, penta means 50. 50 days following the resurrection of Christ, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus through the preaching of the resurrection of Christ from the dead. That was part of the harvest to follow. Part. So first fruits is the first of the harvest. Spiritually speaking, it refers to the harvest of eternal life that Christ's resurrection brings to those who trust in him. From another writing of the Apostle Paul in Romans 6, 5, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. In John 14, 19, on the night prior to the crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, yet a little while, and the world see me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. 
So the resurrection of Jesus is historical fact with far-reaching eternal implications. Christ rose from the grave to give eternal life. And in Jesus Christ, we see that the law and the prophets are fulfilled. That's major. As stated previously, Jesus was crucified at Passover, the Passover lamb. The day following is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Leavening represents sin. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He's the one that removes sin. The Jewish people would eat unleavened bread for seven days, symbolizing the removal of sin. Jesus takes away sin. He's the fulfillment of unleavened bread. Then there's the feast of first fruits when Christ rose from the dead. Followed 50 days later by the time of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people gave their hearts and their lives to Christ. Meaning that if he is the fulfillment of those Jewish feasts, he is also the fulfillment of those yet to be fulfilled. Such as the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the celebration of Jewish New Year, the calling of the Jews together, and what I believe also refers to as the evacuation of the church from this world. The Day of Atonement the recalling of the Jews to God. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, which represents the millennial kingdom of Christ. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of these Jewish feasts. You can read about these in Leviticus chapter 23. Verse 21 for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Paul also speaks about this elsewhere. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This speaks of the effects of original sin. By one man, death entered into the world. By Adam, the first man. And that because of the sin that he committed against God in eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam sinned, death came, and death passes on to all. But by man came also the resurrection of the dead. That man is Jesus Christ. Romans 5 verse 18 and 19 puts it this way. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners... So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Christ was obedient to his Father. Christ always submitted to the will of the Father. Adam was disobedient to God in eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's where sin entered into the world. Because of Christ's submission to God, his Father, sin has been paid for if you receive it 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. I want to put this to your understanding that this is not speaking about universal salvation. Has nothing to do with that. The fact that all will be made alive. It has to do with this, though. There will be a resurrection of the saved and the living. That's what it's talking about here. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And this is found in John. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. Jesus' teaching says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. Talking about the voice of Christ. And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So in Christ all shall be made alive, all will be resurrected, but not all will receive the resurrection of life. Many will receive the resurrection of damnation. Damnation in hell. Just as the believer is given a glorified body that cannot die, the unbeliever is given a body that cannot die. People have asked the question, how is it that someone can be cast into hell and not be consumed by the flames of fire? Well, that's how. They have a body that cannot die. And they will suffer the eternal torment of hell for eternity, eternal torment. So in Christ all shall be made alive. Believers will be raised. Unbelievers will be raised. Believers will be raised to life eternal. Unbelievers will be raised to eternal damnation. Notice in verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, each in his own order. Christ is the first fruits. We who believe are the harvest. As Christ was resurrected, we will likewise be resurrected. Those who have placed their faith in Christ. Concerning the resurrection of the believer, later in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, Beginning in verse 50, this is what Paul writes. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood refer to those who are mortal, those who are subject to death. They cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption. That means that which is decayed or decaying, meaning already dead. Now this I say, brethren, the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. But I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then it shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. For those who believe in Christ, those who have been buried, they will be raised incorruptible. For those who are mortal, that's you and I, everybody in here is mortal. That means we're subject to death. Everyone who is mortal, everyone who is living, who has placed their faith and trust in Christ, when that day comes, they will instantly be changed and be immortal. That means unable to die. Praise the Lord. Our resurrection depends upon the truth of the resurrection of Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, Paul writes, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That word caught up, we that remain and are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. That translates the Greek word rapidso. And that's where we get our word rapture. Rapture. So our resurrection means that we'll live in a body that is immortal and incorruptible. A body that cannot die. A body that cannot decay. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There should be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Praise the Lord. One day, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all suffering for believers will end. Christ is risen. He is our blessed hope. I want you to notice something here. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one. Paul calls the resurrection of the body a mystery. I want to explain that word, a mystery. It means something that is not fully developed in the Old Testament, but revealed in its entirety in the New. It's not that people in the Old Testament had no idea that there was going to be a resurrection of the body because we find evidences that they did know. For instance, Job 14.14. 14. Job, in the midst of all his struggles, his suffering, Job says, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change comes. Job anticipated his change. And it's interesting, in this Old Testament passage of Scripture, as he anticipated his change, 
He understood that because of his own resurrection, he would one day look upon the face of God. And the, the one he would look into the face of was Jesus Christ. Hear what Job writes in John, Job 19, verse 25 through 27. This is his testimony regarding the resurrection, regarding the fact that Job would see God face to face one day. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Job said that after his body is all deteriorated, he looked forward to the day when his change would come. He looked forward to the day when he would see God with his own eyes. This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Isaiah anticipated the resurrection. Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live. Together with my dead body they shall arise. Awake and sing, ye who dwell in dust. For your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. These people had some sort of an understanding, at least a little, of the resurrection of the body. But in the New Testament, it is fully developed that the resurrection, our resurrection, is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus. In light of this message, as we come together today to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we must recognize that there is going to be a resurrection of those who are lost. In the hope of our resurrection, we need to live as people of hope. This life is not all there is. Praise God. There's another life coming. A life with a glorified body that will never hurt again. That will never suffer, will never sorrow. Those who are without Christ do not have that. Let us be sure this resurrection day that we live in the strength of that hope. That we have opportunity to share with those of the world the hope that lies within us. And that hope is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. With every head bowed. And every eye closed. Christ is alive. And he's coming again. If you are here today and do not have Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we give you the opportunity at this very moment to receive him into your life and to have this hope that we've preached about this morning. If you're here today and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior,
Today is the day. Now is the acceptable time. Will you receive him?